So I am Pavan Agnihotri. I'm a principal solution architect with AWS. Uh, I've been with AWS for about three and a half years, uh, working in large enterprises, specifically financials, for 13 years before that. So very familiar with how enterprises use and uh, use infrastructure and IT departments <coughs> within uh, these large enterprises, and will be here to help you adopt AWS. Join with me today. Hi, everyone. My name is Shabazz Alam. I'm a manager in AWS Professional Services. I've been with AWS for a little bit over three years as well, uh, focused mainly on large enterprise customers and helping them understand how to design, architect, and migrate over to AWS. And we're also joined here by Greg Dumont from Nielsen, who will be talking to us about how their journey to AWS went and how they decided upon what the best design pattern for their requirements equated to. So, so basically, we are going to cover uh, you know, how to get started on AWS in terms of your account setup and what kind of VPC patterns you should be using as you adopt AWS. So I speak to a lot of customers in the enterprise area, and more often than not, you know, we have an engineer or a, or a developer sitting on the keyboard having given the permission to open an account and run workloads in AWS, and then they're wondering, what do I do next? How many accounts do I need to create if I'm running an enterprise? Uh, how many uh, VPCs do I need to create? What are the patterns that you need to follow? And how do I make everybody in my company happy, right? Because everybody likes to run their workloads in AWS, so what do I give them? The other thing they also think about is, am I doing this right? What are others doing in this area? How are they creating their VPC and account patterns? So before I get started, I just want to give a quick overview of what does it mean to have an AWS account, and what does it mean to have a VPC, right? How many of you are familiar with AWS beginners? Pretty good, okay. So the next couple of minutes will sort of be a review. So hang in there with me for that uh, as, as we cover some of the basic foundations because this sort of helps us set what is required for a pattern. So as, uh, as you guys may already have know, heard or know that AWS operates a global infrastructure, right? So there are 14 global regions with 38 availability zones. So when you get an AWS account, you are automatically given permission, or you automatically have access to create your VPC in any of those regions except for the China region, right? So you have that flexibility. Some of the customers ask us, what should I do? Where should I, what region should I use? So I think the answer for that is the region which is required by their applications, right? So if there are data residency requirements, if there are uh, latency requirements, that should be your home region. So when you have an account, the first thing you choose is your default region. So you create a region there. And obviously, a region has multiple availability zones. Uh, so you are not, uh, you know, you have the availability zones to help build resilient applications. Uh, they are highly redundant. Each AZ is a, by itself, a tier three plus a data center, if you, if you imagine. It has separate power. It has independent uh, network connections. It's built on different floodplains and so on, right? So it gives you that uh, separation from each other that you can use for your applications. And then within an availability zone, uh, you have data centers, right? So a definition of an AZ is having one or more data centers, uh, which are, again, built in a way that they, a failure of one AZ does not cascade into a failure of another AZ, as well as they are all connected by a low latency network so that you can assume they are like a LAN environment uh, for your application. Our data centers have tremendous capacity, right? So we build data centers with tens of thousands of servers. Some numbers are up there. 
uh, basically, you are not going to know where your application runs. It's going to be running on some of those servers, right? So when we look at creating an account in a VPC, the first thing is the region, right? Second thing is in the region you're supposed to, you want to create a VPC. So now what is a VPC? Basically, it's a, it's a way of getting your own isolated area in the AWS cloud. This segregates your application stack and your network communication from others who may be using the AWS cloud. So when you are using the AP, uh, Amazon VPC, AWS VPC, all traffic inside the VPC is your own. You cannot see traffic outside, nor can people from outside see traffic inside your VPC. It also allows you to define your own network. So think of a VPC as an empty data center. When you're creating a VPC, look at it the same way as if you're creating a data center in the cloud. It's your private area. It's where you put your network, bring your subnet, where you bring your uh, firewall rules, where you put your routing rules, you put your gateways, uh, you define network access control list. So all of this just goes into a VPC. So when you're looking at your account setup, and we'll come to the patterns, basically you're choosing an AWS region. With an AWS region, you're going to choose a VPC. For the VPC, you're going to define a specific network CIDR block, which may, which may be something that your network engineer has defined saying these are free IP address ranges that you can use. Within a VPC, you have, and a VPC spans across the whole region, right? So you have the flexibility of using all the availability zones within that region. And then you create your subnets within the VPC. Subnets are like LAN segments. So you have all of that flexibility. Now, when you're looking at the patterns that we talked about, so this is a quick overview, right, so just to set the foundation. So when you're looking at the patterns to create or the starting point that you want to look at for creating your account, there are certain things you want to keep in mind, right? What, what we see from this, what we see from the VPC and uh, account information, some takeaways are, they form a security boundary, right? The account, AWS account basically forms a security boundary. Everything that happens within an AWS account is, from a permissions perspective, limited to that account. Unless until you define roles which are cross account, but basically when you create an account, any and all access is limited to the users and groups and resources that you have defined within that account. So that's a security boundary. So that's something that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about your starting point. What's the goal that I'm trying to achieve? Do I need multiple accounts? Do I need a single account? How are my users going to access this? All data stored within account is managed and controlled by the security policies that you create within that account. So any IAM policies you create or any data that you put in the account is only visible to users of that account. Unless, again, caveat that with the fact that if you specify cross-account roles, which is an advanced feature, then you have cross-account access. But you have to give access to people and users and groups specifically for them to use <coughs> anything within that AWS account. So first thought in mind is it's a security boundary for all actions that you need to do with AWS services. Second is resource containment. So any resource that you create within an account is limited to that account. You know, it, you cannot have an EC2 instance span two accounts. You can't create an EC2 instance and say, okay, you know, half of it belongs to my business one and half of it belongs to my business two. You cannot move resources from one account to another dynamically. So once you create an EC2 instance, it lives and dies in that account. 
to transfer data between account, basically, for example, if you have an EC2 instance, you have to take a snapshot and share that snapshot with some other account, and then with that snapshot, or create an AMI, and then create another instance. You can't just say, okay, here's an EC2 instance, I drag and drop it to my other account. All AWS accounts have soft and hard limits, right? So there are limits to API calls, there are limits to how many resources you can create. So from a resource containment perspective, you need to keep this in mind. What is the goal I'm trying to achieve? How much data am I going to put there? Who is going to use it? Will I ever need <clears throat> to share this with different accounts? So that's the design concept that you need to keep in mind. Thirdly, we look at financial responsibility, right? Uh, AWS account is, again, the point of all billing for all the resources within that account. So when you create a resource, all the billing data goes into the account. When you up use our discounting mechanisms, such as reserved instances, spot pricing, they apply to resources within the account. When you use tools like Trusted Advisor, they all apply to that one account where the services. So from a financial perspective, that's another dimension that you thought, think about when you're creating that pattern in your mind or the requirement in your mind. So you're putting all of these things together as requirements of what you need to do for your business. So we looked at a lot of these questions from our customers and trying to give you a starting point of where you would be based on how your company is organized. So Ross Well and Robinson at the MIT Sloan Center for Information Science Research did a study of many enterprises and looking at their IT operating model and basically have classified them into four basic types in a quadrant, right? Based on the amount of standardization they do and the amount of integration they have across the business, right? So this is pretty heavy research that has been done. So we are going to base some of our patterns off of this classification. So I'm going to pull up some patterns and I'll define what it means and there'll be a design behind that. So if you look at unification, right? That's the first pattern. It's the most simplest pattern. Basically, in this, your company is a single entity. Okay? Everything is done by the one entity. Many enterprises may not fall into this, but this is one of the patterns, right? So think about a single business companies like you know, UPS is one single business. They have everything they do is shipping or, or, or delivering through trucks. So everything that they have, all the IT is serving one business. That's a unification model. The enterprise in this model operates as a single entity with IT handling all the resources centrally. How do you recognize a unification model entity, right? So basically, if your company is operating, maybe has a single data center, if you look at your CIO organization, you have a single CIO with various development teams, support teams, operation teams, help desk, all reporting into a single CIO. That's sort of a unification model in the simplest form. Key distribution features are that there's a single technology leader in a unification model IT, uh, unification IT operating model. Every infrastructure that they have is all shared. So there's no different LOBs. It's just one massive company with maybe hundreds of applications. All the applications share the same data center, same infrastructure. Data freely flows across the organization from application to application. They have only one financial responsibility. The CIO gets the bill. Right? Or he, he's the one who's responsible for the PNL. So that's the organizational setup. They have some key business requirements based on this organizational setup, right? 
they need centralized management. They have only one IT department, so it needs centralized management. And it all makes centralized decisions. So it needs to be able to operate in the cloud similarly. Right? It has standardized IT processes based on the single IT department that is there. It has standardized IT processes. And they define the processes across the whole organization. They have shared infrastructure and application data. Right? So when you look at all of these requirements from a unified operating IT organization, now you're thinking in your mind, what kind of VPs, uh, accounts do I need to set up? How many accounts do I need to set up? And what is the VPC pattern? So the unification pattern, one, is very simple. Many of you will recognize this very similar to what a data center looks like today, right? You have one data center. Within the data center, you may have subnets, which are like LANs. You may have divided the subnets in dev, QA, prod. Here we sort of, as a part of best practices, say let's at least separate non-prod from prod. So we have given at least one VPC for prod and one VPC for non-prod. Everything runs under a single account because, as you can see on the requirements, it was a single CIO, single financial responsibility. They just need to get one bill. Security is all federated through a single LDAP to into one AWS account. You can do fine grain control over all the AWS resources from that federation. And the central IT team is responsible for everything, right? So now when you take the, and think about this model, you might want to extend it, but at least you should know the implications, right, of what this model brings to you. We are looking at the implication in three different dimensions, security, operations, and financials. This is based, on, again, on the research that was done of how businesses operate, right? So if you look at from a security point of view, since it's the simplest model, it's very similar to what you guys already run in a data center, you can easily leverage all the security and uh, control processes that you have on-prem, your existing knowledge, and build something very similar on the cloud. Your blast radius is solely based on how well you architect your IAM policies, fine grain control of who can do what. For the best practices, we at least separated prod from non-prod, so we at least limit some of it. But uh, this is one of, sort of, I would say, a slight drawback. It's an open blast radius, right? And you, complex IAM controls and policies are required to achieve that separation. So this might not apply to many of you. By the way, how many are you, of you are from large enterprises? A lot of hands, right? So, so this may not apply. I mean, you know, when we look at cloud, this may not apply to large enterprises, right? So this is what I'm saying is, if you're a single monolithic company, then it's you know, mid-market type company or single operation company, then it applies. In terms of operations, since it's the simplest model, it is aligned to exist what you already have seen. So all your operations, like you know, if you're doing monitoring, logging, it's very easy to take lift and shift whatever you've done before into the AWS account and VPC setup. It's very simple to set up. It requires only one VPN connection or one direct connect uh, to connect you into the AWS cloud. And at least, I mean, from a non-prod versus prod perspective, you may need another secondary VPN connection. But it's easy in terms of setup and very low complexity. The drawback in operations is that since it's one account, if one developer does something wrong in their dev part, the VPC of dev, they may hit the limits. They may launch 30, 40 instances, and your account has a limit of 40 instances, for example. And suddenly you need something in prod. Since it's one account, you hit the same limits. So your developer may be stopping you from doing something in prod. So that's something to keep in mind. 
from a cost and financial perspective, you need to tag your workloads because it's all shared. If you're doing chargeback, costback, showback, you need to tag your resources so that someone can see from a detailed billing re report what your resources are, who needs to be billed back, which, de which development department, and so on and so forth. It's easier since it's one account. You can use the AWS provided tools to dr drill and dive into our tools such as Cost Explorer and look at what the details of these accounts are. When you are creating budgets and forecasting for uh, finances, you need all the departments to work together because they may be all launching their own requirements of EC2 instances, resources, whatever, but it all goes into one bucket. So that's a financial sort of view of this. Now I'll invite Shabazz to continue with other patterns. So, so the second uh, operating model is called coordination. Coordination is really when you have unique and individualized business units that are trying to serve a common customer base. Right, so think very much like the financial services companies, think insurance companies, where you have a similar customer base that you're trying to cross-sell products to. And so if you look at sort of how the IT organization looks, it's typically one technology leader. That technology leader has a number of direct reports, such as a security lead, as a CISO, an infrastructure lead, but you will have multiple lines of business. And each of those lines of business are responsible for their own applications and their own development of those applications, as well as the operations of those applications. However, when, when you look at their infrastructure model, it typically is you know, a single data center that may be subdivided into different VLANs, um, and those VLANs are really what dictate uh, your environments from a dev to QA to prod, as well as you know, deciding uh, which LOB is maintained in which area. Right? So the, the key thing to keep in mind here is you have a number of different LOBs and they're trying to service the same customer base and potentially cross-sell products. So when you look at the actual requirements, it really comes out to be you want to share the product base, you want to be able to make sure that each LOB is allowed to innovate as quickly as they would like and not be impacted by another LOB in development. Um, however, once you get into production, you want to be able to make sure that those uh, applications are managed and maintained by a standardized process, right? and you're sharing the infrastructure where possible. So this entire structure ends up looking like this. So effectively, as Pavan mentioned, we have good practices of separating out prod from non-prod. Within prod, what we're, within non-prod, what we're doing is we're allowing you to have multiple VPCs per line of business. This allows each line of business to be able to spin up resources as they see fit. This allows them to be able to control their own destiny and not be impacted by how, by how other lines of businesses may be wanting to innovate faster, slower, or such. Right? You're allowing for security and federation to occur by IAM or some other process, whether that be LDAP or AD or federation. Um, and you're also leveraging your shared services environment to be able to utilize things like DNS and, and, and other services as a common threshold. And so when you think about all the different implications related to this, we really end up looking at, from a security perspective, you have to have separate your environments by prod and non-prod, so that, that limits your blast radius. You're able to control connectivity to your on-prem um, by utilizing the existing tools and technologies that you have. So you can still use the firewalls that you have today to be able to help you with it. And you're able to also utilize it from an AWS perspective around using direct connect and virtual interfaces and delegating what traffic should go where. Right? And then, and then finally, you're also allowed to separate how traffic is going to flow from your on-prem into prod versus how it's going to flow from on-prem into non-prod. Right? There's things around VLAN tagging you can use. You can use BGP routing, as well as um, if you want to just use VPN connections, you can create different termination points as such. From an operational perspective, right, you're increasing the, com the complexity of how your network is routed and peered because now you're introducing more subnets, more VPCs, and you have to control how the route tables will coexist with one another. You also need to be able to federate into multiple accounts. 
Um, and so you need to be able to allow for user base to be able to have access to production and non-production. And through it, you also want to be able to you know, take the benefits of this, is that since you are sharing data, since you do want to try to cross-sell to your customers, in production, you can have a standardized environment that's maintained and managed by a single team as you so fit. So even though you're decentralizing non-production to allow for the different teams to innovate as quickly as they would like or at their own speed, you're allowing for your production to be maintained and managed in a, in a, in a standardized fashion um, by a particular team. Right. And then from a financial perspective, you are marginally increasing your cost because you are introducing VPC peering, um, depending on how much data and traffic is flowing between your shared services as well to your LOB VPCs and non-prod. Um, that may have a marginal increase in your cost. Um, but you also have the ability to tag your resources. And tagging your resources is actually very key if you want to d differentiate and delineate how non-prod is going to work. Because since it's all in one account and you have multiple LOBs in one account, tagging will allow you to utilize um, detailed billing reports to be able to determine how and when um, each person or each LOB was able to uh, instantiate a cost. And then finally, you know, your budgeting and forecasting will actually require coordination um, between multiple teams. So because you have a number of different teams in your non-prod account, um, because you really are trying to do one type of resource for prod, you will have to coordinate amongst those teams to know what is coming down the pipeline, how much uh, should you be budgeting for next quarter or for next year. The third pattern that we have to really think about is diversification. Diversification is all about having independent business units with different customers and you know, different expertise. So think of large conglomerates where they're really just tied together from a financial perspective, but they have many different operating units. Right? So think of the J&Js of the world, think of Pacific Life, think of GE, where you know, the healthcare division is different from the aviation division. And so within you know, diversification, one of, the real, one of the key things to understand is each LLB has their own business leader, right? whether you want to call it a CEO or another type of VP head or senior vice president, each uh, business unit has its own lead. And thus, they also have their own technology lead. And they end up having their own technology teams. And they're fairly distinct and separate from one another because they are all catering to different customer bases. They are also catering to internally different stakeholders. And so what you end up seeing is that these technology teams and these different organizations that sit within the same com company end up having multiple data centers. And those data centers are really independent for each other. So the data center for LOB1 rarely ever has any interaction with data center for LOB2. And really, when you're looking at it, is these are companies that are just tied together mainly from a financial perspective. Right? You're rolling up finances and, and, and such, but from an IT play, it's fairly separate. So when you look through the different um, requirements for them, it's all about that you, know, you have little to no sharing of data. You really don't want your lines of business to separate out um, by applications. You, each LOB has their own destiny control. They're not impacted by anyone else. And you really don't have any standardized processes in place. Um, and you don't have a shared infrastructure. So you're gaining some economies of scale just because of the size of your corporation. But you're really not coordinating how those resources are utilized and, and maintained. So what does that really equate to? In the AWS world, this really turns out to be you have you know, at least to, uh, you know, each LOB gets their own AWS account. And continuing along with good practices, each AWS account is separated. So you have a non-product account and a product account. And then you can decide you know, how you want to design your patterns of how many VPCs and subnets within each of those accounts. But the key elements here is that the multiple accounts are separated from a non-prod non and prod perspective per LOB. Right? And this allows each application IT team to be able to control their own destiny. It allows each company to control its own destiny. So when you think through the design implications for this from a security perspective, now you must be able to delegate access control by LOB. Right? Each LOB must control its own AWS account. 
You're also separating your environments and applications by every single LOB, and this really reduces your blast radius to whatever that LOB does. So if LOB1 does not take security as closely into account or isn't as highly regulated as LOB2, they can go ahead and define what their requirements are and decide that they want to take on a little bit more risk or, or implement it in a different fashion. Right? And network isolation now is really based upon VPC boundaries um, as well as account structures. From an operational perspective, right, you have to be able to think about what happens when acquisitions occur or when divestitures occur. So when you look at large conglomerates, one of the key things with them is they're constantly buying companies, changing around their org structure, um, trying to see what works and what doesn't work. And this allows you to easily scale. So you can easily bring on a new business by adding on a new account and a new VPC, and they can control their own destiny. Right? You have the ability to go ahead and maintain the network topology around it, but there is much more difficulty involved. Because now you're thinking through um, each LOB is not coordinating with each other. They must be able to think through the different routing configurations they need. Each data center must, must connect to the appropriate AWS VPC related to that own company. And on top of it, right, you, you're now taking on the risk of not standardizing across LOBs. So the work and effort that LOB1 may have put into developing things like cloud formation templates or developing processes and patterns may not necessarily be utilized by LOB2 um, unless they actively are trying to coordinate and are actively talking to one another, which typically never existed in the old world. So if you're really trying to mimic the pattern and the operating model that existed um, before you moved to AWS, it, you're still going to maintain and, and bring with you some of the different non-standardized pieces of it as well. From a financial perspective, um, you do get some granularity. Right? You can use the detailed billing reports, and you know that this is per account, which means it is per LOB. So you do not have a cross-mixture of different teams, different business units um, you know, coming into your, your billing account. So it's very clean cut. Right? And through that, you know, you know that each LOB now has a responsibility to maintain and manage their own budget. This accountability and responsibility allows them to be able to control their own destiny. And this also you know, puts the onus on them that they can't blame anyone else if the you know, bill is too high, if they didn't forecast appropriately and such. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is from a financial reporting standpoint, you are not getting a consolidated view of the entire footprint. Right? Since every LOB is, is different, and you're consolidating your billing account per LOB and only by LOB, today, you are not able to get an overarching view from a financial perspective of just getting one bill. You will have to look at each LOB's AWS bill to know what, they, what, they incur, what the charges they incurred for that month or that year, and then manually aggregate it across. Right? The last model is called replication. Replication is really when you have different business units or different lines of business that are sharing best practices but do not necessarily need to share data with one another. So when you think of large hotel chains, right, if you think of the Marriott's of the world, the Wyndham's, the Starwood's, right, they have different customer bases that they're trying to target for timeshares versus hotels. Um, and you know, ideally, they would like to cross-sell, but that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, when you look at some banks, um, such as you know, before ING or, or ING Direct, before it was split up, it was allowed to have operations in the U.S. and the Netherlands and Canada, um, and they had different customer bases, but it was just one one company. So, related to this, when you look at how these companies are structured and what they're doing, um, it's really around you do have you know an overarching CEO. Um, and then you have leads for every part of the business, right? And you can call them CEOs or you can call them SVPs. Um, and the, all of these different businesses have their own IT, IT teams. And these IT teams are typically focused mainly on development and operations. You do end up having a shared services organization, and that shared services organization is usually typically focused on support, on infrastructure, on networking, on security. And so when you look at how these organizations' IT data centers are structured, 
you know, you may have multiple data centers. These multiple data centers may be divided up by cleanly by a specific LOB. Um, sometimes they may be court, there may be multiple LOBs existing within a single data center. Um, but the key point around here is you, you're really not having data shared amongst one another. So you've, you've built in a lot of network topology in place to restrict how traffic flows from one to another or whether or not data can be shared. But at the same time, because you have this shared services organization, the idea of having some standardization, some best practices shared across the different teams is meant to um, be, be replicated throughout, thus the name replication. So when you look at the different patterns for the operating models, right? You're, you're, you want to make sure your requirements are you're not sharing data, your business lines have separate application requirements so they can develop and design as they see fit, and there, you know, any standardization that you can take, you will utilize and try to spread across these best practices that work because you, want, you don't want to allow for different teams to redo the same work that someone else has already accomplished and learned from. So, So as you move over into the AWS world, where this is essentially equates to is you have um, a separate AWS account and VPC for every non-prod and prod account per LOB. And on top of that, you end up having a shared services account as well. And again, shared services is really focused on trying to be able to deliver services such as identity and access management, such as AD, such as um, DNS. Um, different routing protocols. And the whole point of this is you're sharing best practices. You develop templates such as CloudFormation templates, such as security policies and security groups that can go ahead and be copied across and reused across the different accounts and by different LOBs. And once you publish these standards around AMIs, around CloudFormation, the LOBs really just have to focus on their applications and what it takes to build those applications and run those applications and then you allow for the shared services team to be able to maintain the standards as to how each VPC is going to be constructed, as well as how everything will be deployed. So you're sharing the core services, your IT teams, your application teams are focused on, on their work, and then your infrastructure team is focused on maintaining standards across. So the, the implications around how security ends up being structured is that your Different network traffic allows you to route how you want your LOBs to access each environment. So from a data center perspective, you have data flowing in from your, your on-prem data center. You can define specifically which VPC it will go to. You can define whether it's going to take a VPN or you want to go use Direct Connect. Um, you can easily separate out the environments, and now you've limited your blast radius even more. And you're able to delegate access across to the different LOBs. Um, because you are allowing for a shared services team to be able to maintain and manage your environment. So, operationally, you're able to scale by adding additional accounts and VPCs. Now, you do have to keep in mind and coordinate across IP addressing space, but this model does allow you to add on a new VPC and be able to peer it amongst your shared services and be able to utilize all the services that, you're, that you're, were made available. Um, you, with this, right, your number complexity increases a bit, but you're able to utilize the standardized templates, such as building out golden armies, building out CloudFormation templates, um, to be able to be reused across the different LOBs. And from a financial perspective, you're able to easily separate up prod and non-prod, um, and you can go ahead and, and define by cost center how the, the spend is occurring. Um, you're able to provide a financial accountability to each LOB based upon their account since that's all sort of coordinated and maintained. And the best thing is you can get a centralized view of your entire financial landscape within AWS. You're also able to take into account um, cost optimization efforts by volume purchases um, and utilizing things like RIs and or um, volume discounts related to our different services because of consolidated billing. So. At this point, I'd like to invite Greg Dumont up to stage to be able to talk about how Nielsen went through their, their decisions of choosing AWS and what design patterns. Thanks, Shabazz. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Greg Dumont. I'm a director of technology at Nielsen. Uh, some of my colleagues refer to me as the cloud C uh, CEO. 
Um, if you're my neighbor, he refers to me as Lando Calrissian because he thinks I'm the administrator of Cloud City. Before I tell you about our journey to the cloud, I'll tell you just a little bit about Nielsen. Um, I think most people think of, when they hear Nielsen, they think about TV ratings. Um, it might surprise you to, to know that my first job at Nielsen had nothing to do with TV ratings. In fact, I started on what we call the buy side, uh, where I quickly discovered that Nielsen uh, collects and tracks all grocery stores and grocery channels uh, across the country and aggregate that data every month uh, to help the CPG uh, industry. So they sell that data back to both retailers and manufacturers. Uh, when I try to explain that to my friends at parties, I would basically say, I can tell you how many 500 milliliter jars of peanut butter were sold in that store last week. Like I said, Nielsen's more than TV ratings. Um, it's actually a premier market research company that's interested in tracking what people watch and what they buy. Uh, so we're a large, very large corporation. We're in 100 plus countries, 44,000 employees, with over 6.2 billion in revenue last year, tracking six, uh, almost 6 billion consumers um, in 25 million stores. Of course, we're also the TV rings company. Um, but we're more than just tracking TV. We all know that people are not watching TV the way they used to. So we are combining TV ratings with mobile, tablet, smartphone. Uh, we track radio and social. We're putting all that information together to create what is called the total audience. Um, popular anecdote there is um, go to parties and say, how, much, how many people watch the Super Bowl? That data comes from Nielsen. How much does it cost to run a 30-second com commercial during the Super Bowl? That data also comes from Nielsen, so it's all, it's all part of our ecosystem. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our goals for the cloud and, and how we decided on our account structure and VPC structure. We wanted to, to leverage a pay-as-you-go model. Um, we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars every year on hardware. Um, we tend to buy it in bulk, and we stuff as many applications as we can on those pieces of, of equipment. Um, just to get the most out of them. So we don't necessarily use, uh, you don't design, one application doesn't get their own server per se, you may have to co-locate. It's, it's basically about using the amount of servers you have to get the job done. Um, so in the cloud, rather than buying and leaving things running, we're going to turn things on as we need them and turn them off when we don't, and ideally save money, optimize, et cetera. Um, agility, right now our internal processes take anywhere from eight to 12 weeks to procure a server. Uh, I ran a pro project six years ago where I needed 240 servers to collect um, digital content. Uh, that program took about 12 months to, to complete. I'd like to think on the cloud I could probably do that same project in about four weeks, considering out of those 240 servers, there's probably only eight of them that are unique. So um, agility is definitely a big thing for us, and the cloud is giving us that, specifically AWS. Um, elasticity. Imagine being somewhere at Nielsen where something like the Olympics comes along and you need a huge burst of capacity for two weeks of the year. Imagine that investment we have to make and then what do we do with that hardware? It just sits around. So now with, with a pay-as-you-go model, that elasticity is built in. So when the rate, when the, the usage spikes, we don't, have to, we don't have to build up this giant infrastructure. We can scale up for two weeks and scale down and budget for that and it, it's a perfect model for us. Experimentation, a lot of what Nielsen does um, is driven by our data scientists. They're creating algorithms to merge panelist information, which is high quality data with set-top box data, which is uh, high volume but low quality, and they create algorithms to bring them together to really figure out what we, uh, we as consumers are doing and what we're watching. Um, so those algorithms take, ideally take a lot of data, and so data science can be constricted by the available hardware. With the cloud, we can spin up environments for them quickly and give them absolute copies of our production data so they can not just run on a small sample but on a much larger sample than they're used to. Um, standards, again, massive company, tons of brilliant technologists, and they all have the best idea. They all want to do it their way. Um, so we have a lot of divergence in the technologies we use, how we use them. Um, we're really hoping that the cloud, and we're driving, it will drive standardization in the way we work, the tools we select, our automation, um, test-driven test de um, development, testing frameworks, things like this. And of course, global. We have a huge global footprint. Um, <clears throat> collecting digital devices, for example, there is a dependency on being able to be physically located to the devices we want to collect, whether it's mobile devices, PCs, et cetera. We need to be in all parts of the world. Um, if a customer tags their website with a Nielsen tag and it sends a ping back to our server and it slows down their website, they take the, they take the tags off and tell us that, that our, our code is slowing them down. So it's very important that we are physically located in the right spots. What do we use? 
We're not using just you know, EC2 and, and S3. We're using all sorts of uh, AWS components. Um, and we looked at every cloud provider, and we benchmarked. Um, RS, we have really tight SLAs. When you're delivering local TV um, overnights, they have to be available every day at, uh, at 8 AM. And if they're not available, we're in the newspaper. So our SLAs are non-negotiable. Um, and we believe that AWS has the processing power to help us meet those SLAs. <clears throat> so here's the way we look today, roughly. Um, so on-prem, we have 22,000 servers across 100 storage arrays. We're talking 10,000 network devices and 213 offices. The organization is more or less structured this way. We have a CEO um, and a single CTO who reports that CEO. And then we have line of business CTOs underneath that, that common leader. So, we have the watch business, which I mentioned is the TV ratings. Um, the engineering teams work on the systems that collect the data across all of Nielsen, but they're generally very um, aligned with the watch business. The buy side is what I was speaking of earlier, where we're tracking a lot of retail and CPG type stuff. Um, Xlate is a new acquisition. We have our uh, CIO organization, which is all of our shared corporate platforms, and then we have our CISO, which um, creates our security standards. So while the CTO has a single budget, each of these leaders have their own development teams, their own strategy teams, their own support teams, their own product leadership, their own prioritization mechanisms. Each one of those CTOs are accountable for their own destiny. Um, so when we look at how that maps into AWS, first I want to say we met with professional services for three days. It was an amazing experience. I learned all kinds of fun new acronyms like on-prem and EC2 and EBS and all this other wonderful jargon. Nielsen has tons and tons of acronyms as well. In fact, every time I change jobs, it takes about three weeks to learn all the new acronyms. So that was fun. So three days, we spent about two hours talking about account structure and we had a very aggressive agenda. So of course we had to get it done. So after two hours, we said, this is the way we're gonna do it. Um, and then one of our lines of business hired a fairly, I mean, very expensive contractor who had a different point of view and said, we should have a single account. So we didn't want to ignore this person. So we got all the leaders in, a, in the room, in a room for what we bought, thought would be a couple days. And we thought we'd debate, you know, how we should do this. And we were in there for two weeks and we started getting pressure from the leaders to just hurry up and make a decision to move on. So it's more or less what we did. So what we kind of realized is there's, there's no right answer. There may be a wrong answer, but there's, there's, there's many ways to do this. And it, I think it really, a lot of it depends on how your organization is structured. It definitely did for us. So um, we decided to go um, with eight accounts. So we separate production and non-production. So that's very simple premise. The developers can do what they need to do in dev and QA and they cannot affect production. That's the way our leaders want it. And we separate by line of business. So we put watch and engineering together because the engineering collects all of our data and the watch organization has to process it. And we didn't want to incur the VPC peering costs. So we, we put those two together. Buy is completely on their own. Um, the watch organization and the buy organization, there's not a lot of cohesion there. there. There is occasions where we share, but they're really two different kind of entities. They have different maturities. They have tons and tons of different product um, streams and technical roadmaps, and they really both need to be in charge of their own destiny, and having their own accounts allows for that. Um, Exalate is a, is a startup company that we bought. Uh, trying to squeeze them into a corporate account would just crush their DevOps culture, and so we left them alone. Um, and just made sure that they were following more or less the same standards as everyone else. In fact, we learned a lot from, from Xlate, um, what a startup can do and how hard it can be to kind of bring some of those principles to a larger organization. And then we have our shared services, which is our, our um, corporate IT uh, area, our, our .com, et cetera, uh, that way. So the advantage of this approach, we limit the, uh, the blast radius. That's the, one of those fun terms we all love to talk about, blast radius, it's so scary. Um, so we separate production and non-prod. Um, like I said, the LOBs control their own destiny. So there's no, no political battles there. Everyone can be as successful as they need to be. We have the consolidated master bill, which means ever, all of Nielsen accounts leverage the, uh, the discount that we've negotiated, um, as well as um, RI purchases, et cetera. All those things can be shared across. Um, our internal network connect connectivity can also be shared across all accounts. So all we have several data centers on-prem that need to connect to the multiple cloud regions, and that, those can all be done through direct connect to each one of these accounts. Um, and then, of course, we have financial accountability across all, each LOB. So like I said, the CTO has the entire budget, but if you ask any one of those main L um, single CTO leaders, they'll tell you, I own my budget, 
I need to deliver to my product leadership team, and they expect this, this, and this, and it's up to me to manage my money. And that's, so that's more or less why this, um, we went this way. Um, the, duplication, uh, the disadvantages, of course, is um, the duplication across accounts. So now you have to have eight VPCs. You have to have eight sets of security policies. Um, you have to set up logging in eight different sections. So that freedom comes with a little bit of overhead. But for us, it was worth it. Um, and frankly, if you do it right, if you're automating everything, it doesn't really matter. Um, and if you're sharing, you're standardizing, you can, scripts that were created in one, one group can be easily shared with the other. And that's really what we've done. We've built a, a cloud COE, which I'm the leader of, um, where we have represent, representatives from each of these lines of business, and we get together, and we agree on standards, and we report back and, uh, and forth to our CTO on how we're aligned to his goals and how we're, we're driving standardization. So there is duplication, but I believe that automation can solve that. Um, there's more upfront work uh, when it comes to allocating your IP ranges. So we are not in the cloud and just in the cloud, so IP addresses don't matter. Our giant network around the world is open and mapped to the cloud. So you cannot have an, an IP address overlap in the cloud and on-prem. So we plan to be in 10 different regions. Um, so we had to really look at our entire network design for on-prem and try and imagine how many regions we're gonna be in in the next five years and start chopping up cider blocks by account, non-prod, prod, with the hopes that we, we know how many we're gonna need, not, not spend too many, you know, do I need 4,000 in non-prod for this line of business or do I need 8,000 or do I need 16,000 or do I need 1,000? I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-numbing the combinations, but you, you just, you've gotta go with your gut and, and work with the experts. Um, and of course, the last, the last possible disadvantage is just div uh, divergence at the account level can, can lead to lack of standardization. So we've agreed on tool set, automation tool sets um, so that there's no debate. You know, if one group's using Puppet, one group wants to use Chef, CloudFormation, Ansible. We, we've picked this common tools and we've all aligned on them. Um, Red Hat versus CentOS, all these things. We've agreed to a certain amount of standardization. Below that level, there, there is still some flexibility for teams to, to go their own way. So whether you're centralizing your operations team or you're embedding it into your development team and having a true DevOps organization, we're not forcing that standard yet per se. So that's where you can kind of get a little bit of um, um, de-standardization. So. Bring it all together, okay. so. This is my last slide. This just gives you an example of one of our accounts. So, um, this could be non-prod or prod. So what you see at the top uh, left and right are two of our significant data centers um, in Lebanon. Uh, that's in Ohio, by the way. Um, and Tampa da our Tampa data center, which is in a hurricane zone, which is interesting. Um, so that's where all the TV ratings are done for, for America, is in, in Tampa. And uh, Lebanon is also pretty massive. So tons. Tons and tons of servers in there. We have um, our uh, direct connect into our VPC in the US East region. We have one VPC per account, nice and simple. And then what we use, we have HA and DR built in through uh, the two availability zones. So we can do an active active situation we want or we can do failover for DR or for our collection devices. And then we separate um, our applications using subnets. So we got our web layer, application layer, our, our data stores, as well as our dev and QA, UAT environments are all separated um, by subnets and knackles, so. That's the way we decided to do it, and I think Shabazz is gonna come up and just wrap up. We went through a number of different patterns that um, are typical patterns of, of IT operating models that large enterprises face. You've seen how Nielsen does it. Uh, please keep in mind that these patterns are baseline patterns. Right? You will have to customize it based upon your requirements, your specific needs, whatever company you're working with. And so we just wanted to put a couple of different points together for, to just sort of sum it all together, right? So A, understand how your current IT operating environment works, right? Determine which operating model maps closest to what you currently have today. And, and three, what's your propensity to keep that or update it, right? We see a number of different customers who say that they would prefer to do something different if they were to do it all over again. If they were to move forward, they would want to do something different. So think about which is the pattern that you would like to move towards and then use these as the baseline architecture to then customize and define what your flavor of this would look like, right? And if you're, if you're unsure of what, what to do, if you're still stuck, right, start with pattern three. Start with the diversification pattern because that's the one that easily allows you to be able to add and remove and then potentially to coordinate all the others together. So with that being said, I would like to thank you for coming to the session. We know it's, we're standing between you and beer and food and alcohol. 
Um, please remember to complete your evaluations. The three of us will stick around if you have any other questions. But thank you, everyone.